I'm not like you, I'm not a trained teacher. Um, my training in teaching took something like two days, was held at Harry Watt University when I was a brand new lecturer and we went to sessions on how to teach. Uh, there, were, there were people from various Scottish universities there and from all sorts of subjects and the guy I remember particularly was a chemist and he said that in their department they had a joke book uh, and you had to sign out jokes so that nobody told the same joke on the same day to the same students. And I remember thinking how pathetic this sounded, um, but now I suppose I find myself standing here slightly embarrassed because I've only got one joke. And you may have heard it before. It's my first year student joke. I told it to the first year class at St Andrews in English yesterday. Uh, and it goes like this. Uh, it's the first class on the English syllabus at each of the ancient Scottish universities. In, Gla in, Ed Ed sorry, in Aberdeen, uh, the students are all a bit like my dad. They've grown up on a farm in rural Aberdeenshire. Uh, they've got mud in their boots. They're sitting there listening. The lecturer says, good morning, and they just grunt back. <laughs> Uh, in Glasgow, they know that when the lecturer says good morning, he's just playing for time. So they just tell the lecturer to get on with it. In St Andrews, where they're all terribly polite because they come from places like Cheltenham and Bears Den and Chester Hills, they say good morning back. Uh, and in Edinburgh, they write the words good morning down in their jotters. So that's my joke. You've heard it. But the point of it really is, um, please just listen, you don't need to take notes. Uh, there is a handout that has gone round, it's been distributed very meanly. If my son were here, he would have come with a great big rucksack full of them. I, I did come on a bus and two trains with a great big bag of them, but um, I, I brought only 55 and I know there are about 100, I, I was told slightly too late there are 110 of you. Uh, I have morally blackmailed the organisers of the conference um, who can make available a scan if any of you doesn't have a handout and suddenly panics and think, oh, that might be useful after all. You, you can, you can um, email the ASLS office whose email address is... Ah, <laughs> right, okay. Google ASLS and email the office and say you need a scan of this and you'll get one. Uh, but a lot of, I, I hope you can all see it. Uh, rather annoyingly, I'm not going to refer to it much. It's, 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 there, it's there for you to take away because the truth is it's a bit meatier than anything I'm going to say to you. It's a bit more scholarly. It's just if you want something to take away that will, 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 will kind of get you into this subject uh, a wee bit more, then, then that might offer you some, some further material. Uh, when I was writing uh, Burns's biography, I suppose I'm here because I published a biography and an edition of Burns and another Burns book in 2009. Um, but what you have in the handout is actually a, an earlier um, lecture that was part of a series given in St Andrews um, in, in, in 1996. Um, and and it, it focuses really on burns and gender, which is the guts of my talk this morning. But when I was writing The Bard, my biography of Burns, a few years ago, and was co-editing Burns' poems, I rediscovered about half a dozen Burns poems that had been lost to modern readers. Several of them were still in manuscript and had never been published before. And I wish now, to be honest, that I'd made more of that. Um, uh, and, and I wish I had some other new Burns poems for you today. I don't. I'm probably never going to find any more in my lifetime. Um, uh, and so I'm going to focus uh, what I have to say on the small selection of what Ronnie Renton's described to me as the prescribed poems. So if I hardly mention any other poems apart from Tama Shanter, Holy Willie's Prayer, To a Mouse, A Poet's Welcome to His Love Begotten Daughter, Addressed to the Deal, and A Man's a Man for All That, you'll understand why. But let me start a wee bit more freewheelingly, in a way that's addressed to you, not to your students, but which might encourage you to think of ways to present Burns to teenagers who may already associate him with rotary clubs, all-male Burns suppers, dodgy guys in kilts, and haggis. 
Now, from Richard Aldington's classic World War I novel, Death of a Hero, and Arthur Miller's later Death of a Salesman, to Irvin Welsh's Train Spotting, A.L. Kennedy's Day and Beyond, notions of sometimes dodgy, sometimes heroic masculinity have come under intense and sometimes ironic questioning. Perhaps aware of gender issues associated with the later 19th century new woman, the suffragettes, and issues as different as university access and more freely available contraceptives heightened this in the early 20th century. Surely some of the most provocative presentations of masculinity in early 20th century writing include J.M. Barry's unsettling Peter Pan and T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred proof rock. And yet to suggest that heroic or unheroic masculinity is a topic that belongs only to the literature of the last 150 years would be daft. It would mean forgetting not just the Iliad, but also Don Quixote, Don Juan, War and Peace, and the fictions of Austin, the Brontes, George Eliot, Stevenson, and Thackeray. In our era, the topic of gender has been and continues to be, surely, one of the liveliest areas of literary studies. And it's important to realise that Robert Burns's work lends itself wonderfully to arguments about masculinity, about gender roles, and about male role models, topics that matter to girls as well as to boys. And Burns is fun to read. Perhaps I need to tell some of you that, but probably most of you know already. He's sly, sprightly, ironic, provocative and energetic. His poetry has far more immediate entertainment value than that of most of the other romantic poets. I think I'll change that to all of the other romantic poets. <laughs> Burns is supremely performative. Holy Willie's Prayer is one of the greatest dramatic monologues in any variety of the English language, and yet unlike Browning's dramatic monologues, it will make you laugh. Burns is easy to like, though his work is also deep enough to ponder and argue over. And in its handling of verse form, diction, pace, it's full of nimble literary artistry. There are multiple entry points to teaching this poet. He can be presented, as I want to present him today, as a poet mischievously alert to issues of gender. He can be presented, as I've done in The Bard, as the master poet of modern democracy. Though Burns, of course, had no vote, his tone is egalitarian, democratic, companionable. And so teaching him can involve questions about what we might value in a democratic community. He writes in standard English, but also in Scots. He's bicultural, and so his poetry lends itself to dealing with issues of pluralism in Scottish and other societies. He's not a 20th century writer, so including him in your curriculum is a way of reassuring university teachers like me who worry about how little pre-20th century literature some students read. He writes poetry, a genre which, because of its brevity, its memorability, and its bite, lends itself to classroom work and to time-sensitive exam answers in a way that novels do not. In any case, poetry has an intensity that prose struggles to match. In any, uh, uh, you may disapprove of some of these reasons for choosing Burns, but all I want to do is suggest that there are a lot of reasons why he's good to pick. Oh, and the world regards him as Scotland's national poet, which is a reason why some pupils will resist him, but they should at least have some sense of his work. Now, if you're new to reading Burns, or uncertain about reading him, or you think your students might be, then let me recommend shamelessly and with some annoyance the best laid schemes <laughs> published here by Polygon and in the States by Princeton University Press. I say with some annoyance because it's, it's a rival edition that's on the bookstall there. Do not buy that one. Um, buy the best laid schemes. I'm recommending it not just 
because I co-edited it with Christopher McLaughlin, but, and this is where I just, just turned to the second page of the handout, it's got line-by-line line glossaries of Scott's words on the page right beside the poems. The one out there is not so good for teaching with because it doesn't have that. If you're not very great on your Scots, and most pupils are not that great on 18th century Scots, you have to turn to the back of the penguin to find the answers. This is designed for classroom use because all you need to do is flick your retina along to the right and the answer is there beside it. Um, so you don't need to look up a glossary at the back or even cast your eye down to the bottom of the page. Just flick your eye to the right-hand margin and carry on reading. And I strongly suggest this is the best way to make Burns accessible to everyone in the 21st century. It's not rocket science, but you'll be surprised at how few editions of Burns are laid out this way on the page. It makes Burns all the more friendly to readers who don't have any Scots as well. And, and I teach quite a lot of students, students from China, students from America, to whom Scots is utterly alien. Uh, but, but this edition is designed to make the Scots inclusive and friendly. Um, so, shameless plug, that might be one reason why the New York Review of Books described it as the best selection of Burns available. <laughs> Its texts are kosher. Most of them come from editions of his work that Burns saw through the press himself, and a few of them come from manuscript. There are some additional notes at the back, and there's a 20-page introduction aimed at readers who may have little prior knowledge of Burns. So, continuing the sales pitch, make sure it's in your school library. <laughs> if it is, you have the right to photocopy from it for classes. You can make your own line-by-line on-page glosses if you want, but perhaps you've got better things to do. <laughs> and as a sample of the way the book works, I've given you the text of To a Mouse there in the handout. Tam O'Shanter, the most substantial of Burns' poems, is very much a poem about sex and gender. Though I've been arguing this for about 20 years, I continue to believe it. And that's how I teach the poem. So again, I make no apology for rehearsing the argument, which I've given you in much greater detail and at greater length in the handout. You'll see there that I link Burns's work not just to that of his favourite Scottish poet, Robert Ferguson, but also to the pornographic and body imagination manifested by such all-male 18th century clubs as the Beggar's Benison, which Burns did not belong to and whose activities seem to have included masturbation, and the Crochalan Fencibles, which Burns did belong to and whose activities included the laddish relishing of body songs such as Burns's Nine Inch Will Please a Lady. One place to start in Tam O'Shanter is with the words heroic Tam. This is a poem that asks us what sort of man we think a man should be. It's a mock heroic poem because as Alexander Pope, probably Burns's favourite English poet, had done earlier in the 18th century, Burns takes the conventions of epic heroism and subverts them. So you have the epigraph to Tam O'Shanter from a medieval translation of Virgil's Aeneid, that epic of a martial hero whose exploits include visiting the darkness of the underworld. You have the phrase, heroic Tam. You have the poem's hero riding forth and meeting dark forces. Yet from the very start, it's all subverted. For the poem's title isn't Tam O'Shanter, it's Tam O'Shanter, A Tale. And this poem, which is n not only about storytelling, tale as narrative, as chase, as folk tale, supernatural tale, gothic imagining, for this is a gothic work, it's also about something baser, more basic. Tale as what hangs behind a horse's backside, or tail as slang for genitalia, the body, lower body. 
This is the poem Burns calls in a letter the pleasant tale of the grey mare's tail. He knows there's a pun involved. And the fact that Tam rides not a steed, but a mare, matters. For this is a poem about how the male lusts after, ejaculates at, is threatened by, fears, and ultimately flees the feminine. And about how the male is saved by the female. It's Tam's grey mare that rescues him, after all. While it's the female, poor Maggie, Tam's horse, that pays the price. A spring brought off her master hail, but left behind her ain grey tail. The carlin clocked her by the rump and left poor Maggie scarce a stump. That's a mock castration. But when visited, not on the errant by night Tam, but on his mount. The poem itself seems to have its tail torn off in what so many readers register as an over-abrupt and perhaps deliberately unconvincing ending that warns men who are tempted to drink or engage in sexual fantasies, think, ye may buy the joys o'er oh dear, remember Tam O'Shanter's mare. So just as the poem is suddenly snipped off, we're left, wondering, we're left pondering Tam's horse's mock castration. It's a painful poem for men to read, but it's also a poem about sexual voyeurism, a poem for an age of online pornography. Except not quite. Uh, it, not quite a painful poem for men to read, for the real moral seems to be that men can get away with it. Tam is a husband who indulges, if not in extramarital sex, then at least in extramarital lust. The narrator, whose voice often cozies up to Tam and brings the reader over to his side, imagines taking off his own trousers for a blink or the bonny birdies. This is a rather laddish poem by a poet who came from west of Scotland, laddish alcohol culture. By a poet who, when he wrote the poem, was riding at night past an ecclesia. I don't mean he literally wrote it on horseback. I mean the poem, the poem when he, the period when he wrote the poem, um, is a period when he's riding at night past an ecclesiastical ruin between his own marital home and a pub where he was having an affair with a teenage barmaid. It's a poem where the reader rather enjoys Tam's lustful ejaculation, which is a verbal ejaculation, but a sexual one nonetheless, as Tam roars out, <coughs> Well done, Cutty Sark! And then, in an instant, all was dark. Yet it's a daft poem, too, with its hint of hellfire, averted by a hint of the homely smell of fish, and its jokey hinting at marital disaster that's so jokey in its fourfold exclamation, we can't quite take it seriously. Ah, Tam! Ah, Tam! They'll get thy fearing! In hell they'll roast thee like a heron! In vain thy Kate awaits thy coming. Kate soon will be a woeful woman. Few poems have more exclamation marks than this one. The only words we hear Tam speak in the poem are his roared exclamation or ejaculation, as I call it, about Cutty Sark. Another exclamation. All this and the pacing, the gothic catalogue of horrors and the devil and the chase make this a poem of excitement, some of it sexual excitement. Burns writes a lot about the erotic. If they were ever stating the obvious, that's it, but let's state it. Burns writes a lot about the erotic, but the poem is also one which teasingly and slyly prompts questions about gender about just what might be expected from a heroic man, or even from a very ordinary man. 
about whether the poem really ultimately subverts gender stereotypes. Isn't there something subversive about a poem whose hero has to be saved from the female by the female? Or whether ultimately returning the drunk man safe and almost sound to his scolding wife, it upholds a very conventional sense of gender and male-female relationships. Where does the real power lie in the poem? With the substantially homo but not exclusively, but substantially homosocial world of the pub, with Tam, with rationality, or with the female, with the outrageously female, with the night world, or ultimately with the homely female, the home that Tam both longs to return to, yet seems compelled to get away from with his mates. Who is the true mate in the poem? Is it his mare? Is it his wife? His druthy crony? Or is it the poem's narrative voice? Surely a male narrative voice. This poem about sex, gender, alcohol culture, excitement and wild imaginings is able to appeal to teenage audiences and to older audiences. Why? Is it really unsuitable for young children? Should it be banned? Is there something disquieting in having the man who wrote this as our national poet in 2014? A kind of, a kind of posthumous rival to Liz Lochhead. What does this say about Scotland? The questions this poem provokes are very good ones for discussion. The themes of sex and gender are also uncomfortably present in the poem often known as a poet's welcome to his love-begotten daughter, especially if we recognise that really this is not a poet's welcome, but the poet's welcome. It's Burns' own daughter, sometimes called his bastard Wayne, that's in question. Though the orthodoxies of modern criticism warn readers away from biographical readings, Burns is a fascinating poet about whose work questions of biography, impersonality, tradition, and cultural context can and should be discussed. Again, this is a poem that prompts discussion about masculinity, and it's a remarkable poem. It's the earliest poem in the English-speaking world addressed by a father to a daughter, if one excludes dead daughters. And this rarity I've tried this out on several of my colleagues, so I'm trying it out on you, but one of my several challenges to you is find me an earlier poem from this in any variety of English addressed by a father to a daughter who is still alive. This rarity gives Burns's poem a pioneering interest, not least in terms of its tenderness, and surely something crucial to discuss with students is its tone. And, and the good thing is people won't necessarily agree about what the tone is. Is the tone tender? Is it mocking? If it's both, then does the use of the standard Habi stanza form heighten that unusual wobble, that balance, that precarious balance? One might compare the use of standard Habi in some of the other prescribed poems. Is this poem addressing the daughter or really the wider society? If the latter, is it purely confrontational? If the former, then how might that daughter feel when she grows up to read lines such as sweet fruit o money a merry dint? Is that realistic in terms of the relationship between paternity and sexual enjoyment? Or is it unfeeling? But as well as tone, there are questions of gender that go beyond tone. 
Is this someone facing up to his responsibilities? Does it show us a very different aspect of masculinity from that of Tam O'Shanter? If Tam O'Shanter is importantly a poem of sexual voyeurism that has its almost pornographic moments, then a poet's welcome is quite different. That difference signals something not so much surely about inconsistency as about Burns's versatility and control of tone. It can, al it, it, it can also be read as showing a kind of confidence in masculine tenderness. As fatherly I kiss and dot thee, as dear and near my heart I set thee. And that may be all the more impressive in a young man who is coming to terms with an unexpected pregnancy. Just as it's good, surely, to discuss issues such as Burns' attitude to slavery, he almost went to become an assistant overseer on a Jamaican slave plantation, after all. When considering a man's a man, with its mention of a coward slave, so it's essential to discuss in the context of the poem to his daughter, or Tam O'Shanter, or a man's a man, what Burns meant by a man. Is his idea of brothers, conditioned by the kind of homosocial clubs, the Freemasons, the Crochalan Fencibles that he enjoyed, is it laddish? Or should we champion it as democratic, his brotherhood conditioned by the fraternity of French revolutionary liberté, égalité, fraternité? And can we come to terms with the fact that it seems advanced for its day, a day when Burns, as I said, had no vote, and when the word democracy in the 1790s was a dirty one in Britain, associated with violence in France, with the terror that gave us our word terrorism, yet at the same time doesn't seem to include women. Is this idea of brotherhood patronising? Or do we patronise Burns's achievement when we try to subject it to 21st century norms or standards? These aren't questions to shirk in discussing Burns, Instead, they're questions that make Burns so good to teach. Burns' democratic companionability in evidence in the tone of Tam O'Shanter in the very different poem to his daughter and so often elsewhere in his other work is manifest in Address to the Deal. Again, there's an epigraph. I always have to explain to my students what an epigraph means. Most of them think it means an epitaph. Um, some of them think it means an epigram. So, you know, it's, as, as I'm sure you're used to, it just, you, can, you can easily use words and then realise that you've lost your audience because they don't know what they are. But, but again, um, this poem uh, has, an, has an epigraph, a Miltonic one, which, like the epigraph to Tam O'Shanter, reminds us how well read Burns was. Though he never went to university, he was better read than many of my students and many of your students too. How many of either of our students could put their hand up? And I've tried this when you ask them, have you read a major work of philosophy published in the year you were born? They all avoid my eyes at that point. Um, well, of course, Burns had. He was a great admirer of Adam Smith's 1759 theory of moral sentiments. And that work's emphasis on mutual sympathy and understanding reinforces his own poetry's companionability. Even the devil is met with a disconcerting familiarity. And there's a similar scorn for rank at the start of Address to the Deal. Oh thou, whatever title suit thee, as there is in For All That and All That where Burns maintains with regard to a lord's ribboned star and all that, the man of independent mind, he looks and laughs at all that. Burns' stance towards the devil, like his stance towards hypocritical religious fundamentalism in Holy Willie's prayer, is that of a man of independent mind. It's worth getting students to reflect on the pressures that Burns wrote under. Political pressures to conform to the anti-democratic politics of the British Crown, 
He was, after all, a civil servant during the French revolutionary aftermath. Uh, I argue that he was a Republican uh, in my, my biography of Burns. Not everyone agrees. Uh, religious pressures. Uh, he's writing under religious pressures too from some quarters to adhere to a fundamentalist line rather than to his own much more liberal interpretation of religion. Even he's under linguistic pressures from people like me, university professors of literature, that subject that's got underway just at the time he's born, that, that, that the universities that Adam Smith teaches in Glasgow, Hugh Blair teaches in Edinburgh, Taunton St Andrews in Aberdeen, rhetoric and belles lettres, the beginnings of our subject, ing lit. Um, but people, but the university professors throughout Burns's lifetime are encouraging Scottish students to regard their own vernacular language as unsuited to modern literary expression and are trying to get them to adopt proper English free of Scotticisms. So the very title of Burns's first and in a sense only book, Poems, comma, chiefly in the Scottish dialect, is a title freighted with what we now call the politics of language. Burns loves language, odd locutions, folk expressions, vernacular energy set beside high English phrases. He loves riffing on lingo, getting it to dance, banned from local dances by his own father, but sneaking out to them nonetheless. He puts a dance at the heart of Tam O'Shanter, and in Address to the Deal, a poem that's got so many links to Tam O'Shanter, the stanzas dance in a Jinkin poem that images its own bardy, its wee bard, as Lincoln or tripping, but also finding his metrical and actual feet nimble enough to carry him away just out of the devil's reach. Not just the supernatural imagery and nightscape of warlocks and withered hags connect Address to the Deal and Tam O'Shanter. Just as strong a link is their sheer energy, an energy that is verbal and delights in nimble jinking about. But while it's good to see how the prescribed, I won't keep on to call them the proscribed poems, that would make them much more exciting. Um, <laughs> but while it's good to see how the prescribed poems talk to each other, it's also worth emphasising how they show Burns' range, as well as his prescience, his alertness, his insistent presence within our culture, as well as within his own. Though the lines of To a Mouse that are best known are the opening ones, perhaps the most unsettling to us now are those which articulate a sense of ecological disaster. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union. This is Burns the farmer who's alert to the way human intervention alters the workings of nature itself. <laughs> Yet that phrase, social union, so widely used recently by Alex Salmond in recent debates with regard to Scotland and Britain, is one that has come to have modern currency, indicating just how much Burns has been internalised by the First Minister and other politicians and commentators. Salmond knows the carrying power of Burns's language. He said that Scottish students at Scottish universities won't pay tuition fees until the rock melt with the sun if he has his way. But a lot of people who use the phrase social union just think it's a handy phrase rather than one picked up from Burns and recontextualised. To a Mouse is an ecological poem, a poem of fear and trembling in the face of catastrophe. But it's also a poem written out of other kinds of catastrophe. It was written not long after one of Burns's brothers died at a time when the family felt the fear of homelessness and in the wake of a banking collapse. The Ayrshire Bank had failed and its repercussions were still being felt. So the word panic in the second line and crash in the fifth line, words we might be familiar with in those modern bankers' phrases, financial panic or financial crash are words that resonate throughout the poem. It's a poem of ecological solidarity addressed by one fellow mortal to another, but also a poem of ecological collapse and, and 
existential homelessness set very precisely, as the full title tells us, in November 1785 and contemplating fields laid bare and waste. It's a wasteland poem. The mouse may sound a bit cute at the start, but, is no, but this is no Mickey Mouse sentimentalism. It's a dark, fearful poem whose last stanza gives it a bleak conclusion. Still thou art blessed compared with me, the present only toucheth thee. But och, I backward cast my ye on prospects drear, and forward, though I canna see, I guess and fear. This is a poem of profound anxiety. Whether or not, as several people have suggested, Burns was depressive, this is a poem which articulates depression. It's the flip side of the near manic energy sensed elsewhere, particularly in Tam O'Shanter. To a mouse is a poem with phrases that do need explanation. Nobody now knows what a daemon icker in a thrave means, and damn few recognise Cranluch called. Yet it's also a poem with some of the best-known lines in 18th century poetry, even if people often misquote them. The best laid schemes o' mice and men gang aft a glee. The power there comes almost entirely from monosyllables and plain words, but plain words linked not just by alliteration, but by hints of assonance and internal rhyme. The way that sharp e eh of best is picked up in the sharp e. Eh of men, or the way the sharp a ah is repeated in gang after glee. This is a poet with a great ear, and a great ear is what matters most in poetry. It's also that great ear, and I'm on my last paragraph, that makes Burns one of the world's most famous and best songwriters. I'm sorry that the prescribed selection of poems, which is in many ways a very astute selection, Misses out, almost, misses out all of Burns' love songs, which are for many people his greatest achievement. If you wanted to supplement the prescribed reading, I'd suggest you add some songs, not just Auld Lang Syne and My Love is Like a Red, Red Rose, but also songs written clearly from a woman's perspective. Oh, whistle and I'll come to ye, my lad. John Anderson, my Joe, might be good ones to add, because it's important not to present Burns only as a laddish voice, and adding songs like these will enrich any discussions of Burns and gender. I think it'd be good to add some other political songs too, especially Scots Wahe, where hey, it's balancing between the politics of Scottish independence, medieval and otherwise, and the democratic urges of the French Revolution with its overthrow of tyrants. But that's up to you. I know it's not possible to cover all Burns in a few lessons any more than it's possible to cover all the prescribed poems in this one talk. If you want to read more, please do make sure your school library has, the <laughs> has not just the best laid schemes, uh, but the essay collection Robert Burns and Cultural Authority, which contains more on Burns and gender by Kirstine McHugh, by A.L. Kennedy and others, and has, among other things, a shrewd consideration of Burns and God by Susan Manning, who I remember rather wished that she'd been asked to write instead on Burns and the Devil, uh, a superb essay on Burns's use of poetic form by Douglas Dunn, uh, and a great essay by Seamus Heaney on Burns's art speech. Now, I edited this book, but I challenge you to find a better essay collection on Burns, just as I challenge you repeatedly uh, to find a more classroom-friendly format than the format of the best laid schemes. Um, if you want, I'm open to questions now. Uh, and uh, I'm especially interested if anybody would take up my challenge about finding an earlier father-to-daughter poem.